Arthur, this is the penultimate week, and <laughs> you are presenting about um, uh, kind of sort of NPM and WebKit and things like that that you might use as a kind of uh, a more professional JavaScript developer, I guess, um, and how you can use them within, you know, to help with uh, within R. Um, uh, yes, so uh, for those watching elsewhere, um, we're working through the book JavaScript for R. We're getting quite to, close to the end of the book. We're currently on um, chapters 20 and 21 of the book. Um, so, okay, do you want me to pass it over to you, Arthur? Um, sure, sounds good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to kind of work through two chapters kind of quickly. Um, and really kind of like, in a, in a way, I guess you can kind of think of these two chapters in the following way. And I, I, I um, you know, this chapter 20, to my mind at least gives like an overall, it gives an overview of how one, well, about how one could go about structuring, um, basically managing managing JavaScript code, and draws a lot of analogies to to how one would do similar things in R. Points out both the things that are similar as well as the things that are that are different, different or and or kind of differently difficult. Um, so it kind of sets the stage for this problem that then is explained in greater detail in chapter twenty one, uh, where we look at um, Kind of a use case with with um, with npm and, and web uh, um, webpack. Um, so with that said, let me get started. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, both you know both the JavaScript and um, and uh, and R kind of have difficult you know. Managing kind of large complexes is, uh, sorry, large projects is complicated in both, but kind of, um, and, and Java, JavaScript kind of presents some familiar difficulties as well as some new difficulties. So the familiar difficulties are that, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing in large projects that are, you know, more than 300 lines of code, let's say, or 500 lines of code, typically with, with multiple scripts. Um, uh, and and maybe those multiple scripts might, you know, they might be organized in a certain fashion so the developer can better understand what the script is doing. Uh, so they might be segmented in kind of logical blocks, and and those logical blocks might need to be executed in some particular sequence. Um, um, so in R we have we have this uh, this kind of uh, challenge as well as in in, in JavaScript. Um, also, um, you know, kind of point of commonality between JavaScript, another point of commonality between JavaScript and R is that, you know, projects have, you know, may have dependencies. Um, and, um, you know, those dependencies could be either kind of, I'll kind of call them remote dependencies. So packages that exist in some repository somewhere in the case of R CRAN in the case of uh, JavaScript, you know, maybe NPM or other repositories. Um, as, as well as kind of local dependencies, which could kind of be bundled up, uh, bundled up code somehow. So I, I don't know if this is kind of a use of use of terminology, but let, let's think like, you know, compiled code, um, you know, like C++ code in, in R, right? Um, that's packaged kind of lo locally. Um, it's not part of the R scripts themselves, but it's something the R scripts or at least the package depend on, right? So we could have that, that scenario as well in, in JavaScript. So yeah. kind of to summarize like several scripts, um, and scripts potentially with with multiple dependencies, kind of complex dependencies. So those are those are the points of commonality between JavaScript and, and R. Um, but JavaScript has a few kind of new problems, um, or or at least problems that are a bit more pressing in JavaScript or difficult in JavaScript than they are in R. You know, one is is that um, somewhat kind of unlike R. Um, a user, so I guess in this case, uh, you know, a, a, a browser, kind of a browser client, can still go to your page and try to run the script without really meeting the, the 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 requirements. So let's say someone comes to your page with an old browser that doesn't have the 
toolkit embedded in the browser to parse your version, or, you know, like a version or flavor of JavaScript, there and you would have a you would have a problem, right? Um, and and uh, so that's something kind of maybe not wholly unique to 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 JavaScript, but I think much more problematic in JavaScript than than in R, maybe. Yeah. Um, another problem is 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 that you know projects may you know projects in JavaScript really we want to have kind of very felt kind of small small, small um, um, bundles of code um, because they're kind of like a almost a payload that are sent to sent and loaded in the browser with with R we can kind of be um, less disciplined in the sense that we can have large code bases that, that are kind of loaded into the global environment and probably in most cases not worry about kind of the size of the code base and kind of the memory implications of it. Yeah. Um, in, in, in the case of JavaScript, we, that's something we need to worry about. So we need to have some mechanism for making our code smaller, you know, occupy less this memory. And last kind of special piece, and all these three kind of uh, pieces kind of foreshadow uh, sort of solutions that we'll, we'll see subsequently, you know, and uh, how JavaScript manages, you know, uh, JavaScript code bases. Last one is that um, the JavaScript kind of packages, if I can call them that, that um, you know, do indeed consist of many pieces like a, an R package, but their packages don't require a, kind of enforce a particular structure. You know, in R we have a very rigid structure for, for, for packages, which, you know, is, is kind of liberating in the sense that, you know, you have only to follow this model and, and you have something that works, um, uh, but, you know, may, may kind of tie our hands a little bit in terms of creativity here with JavaScript, it's, it's much, much, much freer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to, to then kind of the, the, the solutions to the problems. Um, uh, so, you know, one, one kind of Problem here is that you know, I mentioned kind of at the outset is that you know your your kind of the client may be so the browser that you're um, serving content to may be outdated. Um, so I get kind of a, maybe the, the laughable case of enterprises requiring Internet Explorer version version 11, which I guess is not even supported by Microsoft anymore. Um, uh, you know you could have this this case and you you need to have something to do about it. Um, uh, or, or just more generically, you know, you may have some code. You may be writing your scripts in a version of JavaScript, um, you know, like SMAC 2015, yeah. and then you know you need you want to be able to serve up an older older version, but without having to go through the pains of rewriting your code manually to be in that older version of of of, of JavaScript, right? So re really, this is kind of Problem. So luckily, it's quite an interesting viewpoint, though, isn't it? Really, that and, and it is. Yeah. Actually, when I was working through the book, I, I I did like, I did find it strange that a lot of the JavaScript code that was written in the book was written using, you know, var to declare variables and things, rather than const and let and things, which are a couple of years more recent. And and it was only really when I started looking at this chapter that it kind of dawned on me that that the scripts that we were writing in those earlier chapters they're going to be they're going to be sent to the browser unmodified ah. the browser will have to handle what we send to them so there's a, a much more limited set of browsers would be able to use the version that i rewrote them thinking i was writing them in modern javascript for a good reason um but, i didn't pick up on that russ that's a really interesting uh, observation yeah but um, following what I do so many presentations now, I don't even know if it was this. Um, uh, there was there was something similar that I was talking about recently, where um, there is so had the JavaScript that I'd written with const and let and stuff in there been re been um, put in an appropriate directory of an R package, there is a tool that can like, I think it's called Packer or something like that, that can kind of um, create files that would have been the JavaScript of the time five, six, seven years ago or something. And then it will be those files that are sent over to the browser rather than the ones that you write in modern JavaScript. So it's quite neat. Uh, this this viewpoint, and I really didn't catch up on it at all, and while I was kind of working through the earlier chapters. Anyway, 
Well, I mean, actually, this uh, maybe kind of like a sidebar, Russ, is a, I, I kind of wonder if anyone is working on on kind of this problem on the R side, right? I, I'm just thinking of something as, as silly as, um, you know, Magritter pipe versus the, the native pipe in R4, you know, dot X. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, clear, clearly things have changed over time and, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have have some way of, you know, transpiling um yeah. maybe to target older um older deployments perhaps uh yeah, yeah. i don't know i just don't a think passing it's passing it's a thought. funny one though isn't it because i i'd be i'd be surprised if there's that much movement on that front but the there may well be you know um what do they call them um you know industries like um pharmaceuticals and yeah uh actuaries and, and things like that where they're quite kind of regulated the you know um the you know the packages that they use have to be kind of verified and stuff yep. for, for security reasons and things like that um there's probably people working in those industries that are using r3 still rather than undoubtedly yeah. yeah yeah and um probably other um uh, slow moving places so there may be a value in making sure that um the packages you're developing in are are um uh, valid code for earlier versions of r yeah. and there's yeah. ways of setting it up in like continuous integration and stuff to check that the package you've written will run on 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 an earlier version of r but all the dependencies that you sit upon also have to kind of res respect that as well and uh, yep. I, I, to be honest i think in the r world because the language itself um updates at such a, a relatively slow pace compared with you know like the core of the yeah. language yeah um it it may not be something that that we see much movement on uh, yeah but anyway that's that's a good point and i you know like the r core really i mean at least from what little i i think i understand r core really tries to do a lot to not make breaking changes mm -hmm. um so it's kind of you know new new functionality that didn't didn't exist before rather than yeah. i mean w with some exceptions you know but uh, those exceptions i think are few and few and far between yeah. um but anyhow like I guess for this JavaScript problem, then there, there, there's this need to sort of take a code base that's written in some version of JavaScript and then kind of um, you know, transpile it. So kind of sort of rewrite it into um, a syntax that would be acceptable for, for uh, a client running a, an older version of, of JavaScript. And luckily, you know, there, there appear to be tools that, that allow one, uh, and the one that was mentioned in the book, Babel, I don't know much too much about. Uh, I, I've kind of seen it in passing. Uh, uh, I think by my reading allows one to kind of take a code base and you know some JavaScript version X and then kind of transpile it into version Y. So you can have a target environment and uh, sorry, a source environment and a target environment, and, and you can kind of make backwards compatible code, right? Hmm. So that's that's kind of the solution, as I understand it, that's the solution to to, to this problem. Whether it's perfect, I, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Probably, un undoubtedly, there have to be these kind of edge cases that from developers, uh, you know, but uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so so then kind of this, this idea that we want code to be kind of small in terms of this, the the the, the memory, you know, the memory that it occupy, you know, kind of size that it occupies is sent over to the browser. So you know, we need we need to have um, smallest files possible, uh, smallest files possible, um, and, and and so there there are tools for kind of what's called minification that simply reduce you know removes white space. Um, um, white space from, um, from, from, from your code. So, I mean, you could have something that, that spans several lines, uh, you know, reduced into a single line without, without any, you know, carriage returns and with minimum amount of white space, you know, these kind of things that are helpful for us to read, uh, aren't use aren't necessary for, for, for the browser, but occupy memory. Right. Uh, so just yeah. sort of reduce that out of the code as well as, 
Um, I didn't realize this until reading the book, uh, short, and, short and variable names. So that was, that was kind of interesting, um, although maybe problematic. But um, uh, I mean, if some other things depend on your having a particular variable uh, name. Um, and then lastly, uh, kind of bundling. So this is the idea that, um, you know, we want, um, you know, the, the problem is that, um, you know, browsers want to load, you know, we need to load some script in the head of, of, the, of the DOM. Um, ideally, a single file. <laughs> um, um, but developers, you know, want to have several files because that's a convenient way to organize themselves. They may be reusing modules from other projects. Uh, so they're they're working in a multi-file world, um, and, and and they probably want to exercise some control over how, you know, if, if things are combined into one single file, how they're combined, right? The order in which they're 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 um, combined, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, and so for this, you know, basically this 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 is called bundling. We want to basically take a, a set of a set of Kind of um, scripts and, and other things as well, I believe, and 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 combine them into uh, you know as few files as as as, as possible. So they're bundling tools like npm, webpack, uh, etc. I think you mentioned parcel earlier. Um, uh, I think the, the tools oh, are no, legion. I Packer, but, uh, yes, oh, Packer, okay. Um, um, yeah. There's also, um, I mean, a lot of dependencies. You don't really need all of the code within them. And exactly, maybe exactly. These tools also kind of may be able to filter out unnecessary bits, because certainly things, I mean, when, like when you install an R package, you don't install the tests for that package, and you don't exactly. install um, a couple of other parts of it as well. Um, so, I don't think the book went into this into too much detail, but I was nevertheless kind of left with the impression. Yeah. Let me know if you've had the kind of the same impression, Russ, is that uh, sort of like importing um, functions is very kind of like Pythonic in its approach in the sense that you, um, you as a developer, um, um, as, as you're kind of constructing the inputs for, for um, your system to create a bundle for you, you're, you're importing certain certain functions by by name um, into kind of the set of things that you need you actually need so I'm, I'm guessing that on the back end these bundlers are kind of going through and parsing parsing your source uh, your source files whether they're you know external dependencies or code that you've 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 written and then stripping out those bits and leaving the rest kind of on the cutting room floor um, yeah I, I imagine so I, I, they have a wonderful term for this in in the javascript world which i've never seen elsewhere in programming they call it tree shaking i think where <laughs> like um if if you take a dependency on some module but you only use a small part of that module maybe you only need like a bar chart functionality from some library and you don't need it you know it's pie charts or it's line yep. graphs or whatever the, there's a yeah this tree shaking thing will see that you're depending upon one set of classes or objects or functions or whatever and will um identify kind of recursively identify any other part uh, of that I module see. that it depends upon and strip away everything else it's, it's such a lovely like term for it but anyway, yeah oh, that's neat that's, cool. that's really neat Actually, um, um, I don't. I don't know if this will be the future of R. I, I remember that um, you know, R Studio Conf. Uh, I forget who it was. Said that the little, someone asked them. You know, what it was one of the uh, R developers, uh, R Studio developers asked them, "What's the thing that you're most excited about?" And there's some some package that kind of takes this uh, you know approach that you see in Python. I guess also JavaScript, maybe other languages of sort of importing individual functions. Uh, you know, rather rather than a library where you're just loading all of the all of the the functions from a package but instead targeting individual functions and also had this capability like also exists in javascript where you can kind of name name these functions as as well kind of give them an alias although wait yeah. i could be wrong about that in javascript i know in python you can give them an, an, an alias um yep so anyway um these are kind of the solutions for 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 these particular problems in javascript um uh one kind of last thing that i guess is 
more like a level of, of abstraction here, or just an observation, is, is that, you know, um, the book kind of makes the point that in, in a sense, there's a sort of decoupling in, in JavaScript between the code that the developer writes and then the code that gets um, that gets kind of uh, passed over to 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 the browser uh, in a project, and that there's this JavaScript kind of tool chain that that helps kind of converting the the input files um, into outputs outputs that are kind of taken as an input for the for for the page it's, it, itself. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was kind of kind of interesting, you know. <laughs> and, and, because a lot of I mean the thing like the great thing about javascript is that basically if you have access to a browser you can start writing in javascript if you want to learn how to program and you've never done it before you don't have to download an ide and a compiler and everything like that and um because you can just open whatever dev tools and write in a in, in the console in there and pretty much everyone has a browser yep. on their computer um and to step from that to going well actually if you if you want to write anything usable you'll have to learn all these build tools as well <laughs> and like kind of define you know build pipelines of increasing complexity it's um it's quite interesting it, and, and, and then also, two years it, hence it also uh, seems like something that we're kind of protected from in r because uh, the, a lot of the you know um the, the the steps involved in building and installing a package are well i mean unless you're depending on Rust or you've written your own C++ or something like that. They're fairly standard from one package to another, which is the beauty of this uniformity of the, the package structure there. Um, Very true. Yeah, cool. Right. Yeah. It's... Um, yeah, and then kind of the last bit, which is a little bit of a, of a, lead, a lead into the next, the next chapter is, you know, um, you know, in JavaScript, like in R, you're you're very often going to want to be um, uh, fetching external packages. Um, you know, uh, R of course can fetch from from CRAN. There are other repositories like R Universe, but at least from the command line, kind of "quote unquote" natively, R will fetch from CRAN, and um, Node fetches from from npm. That's sort of CRAN esque, except that you know CRAN has strict requirements about you know what a package is and looks like and contains um, you know where it should work um, npm comes with no such requirements or guarantees um, so kind of caveat emptor you know it's like buyer buyer beware um, um, is it then on to the next chapter um, on discovering Webpack and NPM. Um, yeah, I, I thought this is kind so, of an interesting- so we're, talking oh, sure. about N, we're talking about NPM, the package repository, rather than NPM, the kind of command line tool. I know that they're basically coupled together. Yeah, so but, uh, the com actually the command, uh, the command line tool um, right, here. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, It'll end up touching on both, actually, um, but sort of more so the kind of the command command line tool. Um, the, this this chapter is a little bit of a strange chapter, I think, um, in, in that I mean, maybe not strange, but it spends a lot of time um, talking about npm and how npm works. In a certain sense, it's it. I felt it was a little bit akin to like an npm version of. Um, you know the whole game chapter in uh, Hadley's uh, you know uh, R packages book, yeah. in that it it sort of endeavors I think without saying so explicitly to sort of talk about the process and then a, a bit the tool chain that that yields yeah. the process and then at the very end, actually maybe it's not akin to that at all on, on further reflection but uh, and and then at the very end has like a worked example I think it would have maybe been more helpful perhaps yeah. perhaps um, sort of inverse things where, where there's a little bit of a worked example towards towards the end um, that I won't be touching on, I, I guess, for lack of for lack of time. Um, but uh, so it, it, it is kind of a, a curious chapter. Yep. Yeah. 
in the chapters that led up to this, we've written a lot of R and within the R packages or in the shiny apps or whatever that we were writing, there were um, JavaScript files that we'd written that were kind of kept alongside. Yep. Is, is the purpose of this chapter to kind of explain that you, you could take the JavaScript file that you've written and publish it on NPM rather Not than having it embedded within your um, R package and, and, and maybe decoupling the two might Make it so easy. so it, it doesn't it doesn't talk about that um, so much, Russ. Uh, I mean, except to say that one could publish lots of things to npm. That the you know the barrier to kind of publication is not is, is sort of low. Um, but it, it it seems like the, the focus of the chapter was instead um, how to, how to put it kind of in, in shortly um, or in compact terms, basically. Saying like, let's imagine you have a project that uses that uses JavaScript, some of which could be local, um, some of which could be kind of external dependencies. How would you, using npm, kind of go about handling these 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 things? So it kind of adopts this sort of complex case from the get-go, um, where you know you may be installing. So so it's more much more, I guess, is a with respect to NPM, the repository, much more positioning the reader as a user of NPM rather than a developer contributing okay, to okay. NPM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but but actually, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't recall whether it talked about how to how to go about doing so. I'm sure there's just a you know command line near NPM publish or something, something sure. to that effect. I, I watched briefly a little tutorial from from YouTube on how how to do so from. You know, the perspective of someone just working in NPM, pure NPM, uh, divorced mm -hmm. from 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 Shiny, but the book, as I recall, doesn't doesn't talk about that um, in in as much detail, at least. Um, so, kind of the the first section, I, I'm just kind of with the presentation, I'll kind of slavishly go along, I suppose, with the contents of the 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 book, for for lack of a more creative approach. Uh, you know. You know, first, like let, let's imagine you want to have an, an, an NPM project in order to sort of manage your manage your your JavaScript code base to have it in one place, and then also to, to kind of have at your disposition all of the tools that we discussed previously um, to solve these problems. You know, transpiling your code, bundling your code, etc. Et so, in order to benefit from that, you want to have an NPM project. So, um, let's. I think NPM project might be best explained. And kind of in, in reference, you know, in comparison to you know an R in our package or our project. So with R, you know, we just have available to us this these kind of nice commands, you know, use this uh, create package or create project that when executed, you know, creates the folder that we want um, in, in the kind of the target directory, and then kind of creates all the the scaffolding um, that you might expect the the folder the folder that we need uh, to contain our script the the description file etc and then you know thereafter um, we go and go forth and develop you know create our scripts populate the dependencies uh, you know um, export files into the into the package namespace etc right npm is kind of both similar and different um, and I think at least in my lights kind of has some interesting has an interesting approach that I almost kind of wish were present, a little bit more present with use this personally. Um, so with NPM, you know, you, you, you for <laughs> small little pieces, you actually need to go about creating the project folder first. Um, once once you do, you kind of just CD into to, to, to that folder and then type in the command line NPM init, which which is sort of akin to, you know, this use this create package or create project. And 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 the same things sort of happen as as I understand in the background, all the scaffolding gets put in place. Um, and, and what's interesting, this is I think the interesting bit, is that is the 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 command line that like the CLI tool asks you, you kind of prompts you as a developer user for certain information that kind of populates um, some of the metadata uh, about about your project. So, um, for example, it'll ask you, you know, which uh, helps you kind of populate this packages.json, which is akin to the description file. Um, you can select a license, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you can also blow past this with a, a little um, dash Y flag 
Um, but I thought it was kind of neat that in, in a certain sense, um, it's not that there's parameters of a function, but the command line tool asks you for, for, for these things with, you know, uh, use this, it's maybe a trivial thing. You have to go looking for a function to okay, accomplish yeah. a particular action. It's, you know, it, it's not a big deal, but I thought it was interesting how the, the approach is yeah, different. Yeah. So NPM kind of sort of puts you in on the right path, uh, you know, uh, in, in that sense. Um, then for installing packages, um, again, I'll kind of point out some, some comparison, you know, make some comparisons, point out the similarities and also the differences. You know, with R, of course, um, you know, if you're installing a package, um, you know, what's, What's interesting about R is that when you install a package is by default, the scope of that package is global. So it's installed on your machine and available to every project that you'll create on your, on your machine. Um, and you can only really make it local to a project if you're, if you're using RENV, you know, RN, right? Mm -hmm. um, NPM, it it's actually has the, the, the opposite default behavior. So, um, if you're installing some npm package with this kind of command line uh, script, you you um, you by default have um, have a package installed that's local to your project. So it, you actually have to make an additional step if you want the package to be installed globally. Um, you just have to insert this kind of g g flag that makes it global in scope. So for example, if you have this. Uh, I think it's a Doxify um, package that'll kind of uh, serves to create documentation for packages. That's something where there's a use case for having it installed globally, but by default with NPM, you're going to have the packages installed locally to, to that particular project. Yeah. Um, and I and in similar, uh, I have a tool that I use that pulls the, um, you know, the git ignore files. Uh -huh. um, that, that say so there's on github there's a bunch of different git ignore files that contain typical file types that you'd want to ignore in yep. an r project or in a c project or whatever um and i have a something i've installed from npm called git ignore that i can run from the command line it's, so it's like git ignore r and when i'm in an r package it will populate the git ignore file um, from that github repository so i don't have to go and copy the actual content of it and because it's something that you'd use you it's not something that you would need for that package to run that you know the package that you're developing um but you might need in multiple settings it makes more sense for it to be a global thing so yep. that is quite it is quite nice to be able to sp specify those kind of things i i also know I, I think you can also specify um similarly to how you can differentiate between imported files and suggested files, uh, yep. imported packages and suggested packages now you can kind of distinguish um packages that are needed at runtime from those that are used while developing yeah, exactly. I thought that was a really fascinating distinction that exists in in in, yeah. in NPM that doesn't in an R. Um, I thought quite quite helpful because it, you know the motivation here is, is that you, you want to have as uh, sort of like the code base that you create into a put into a bundle and then pass over to the browser. You want to be as as small as possible, and so you don't want to include these needless dependencies that have nothing to do with the business logic, right? With R, I guess we can sort of be a little bit less disciplined on that, that front. But I thought that was a very interesting distinction. Um, I, I had, um, I've not used Gollum very much to, to my shame, but it, it seemed like a little bit, you know, Colin, you know, in, in the book, it seemed like, and in Gollum in particular, it seemed like there, there's the beginnings of that dependency in R, at least insofar as you have this dev directory, um, that sort of tries to document the process by which you create the package, which is maybe a little orthogonal to this, but it seemed like there's this attempt to sort of like draw this uh, this this little bit of, of uh, like seg segment like the business logic packages from the dev packages in a certain yeah. sense, yeah. which I thought interesting. Uh, yeah, 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 cool. Uh, I mean, um, with with Gollum, it. Uh, it, the, the, I yeah I do agree. The, so those those dev scripts are things that you wouldn't dream of 
installing when you, you you know you wouldn't include them at build time when you're installing an R package you know for a, a column app um, um but they yeah they are quite useful in that like a, a lot of the commands that are in there are quite useful when you're setting up your package yeah yeah, yeah. anyway sorry not to go off didn't re-say what you've just said <laughs> <laughs> well no 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 i mean it's helpful uh, russ yeah. i mean you you, yeah. you you i imagine are uh, much uh, you know a much more proficient user of golem than i so i mean that, that i'm not too wrong is helpful to know <laughs> uh, uh, the other thing I thought was kind of interesting about NPM, you know, again, this is sort of like the the, the defaults that are available um, is, is that, uh, you know, whenever you're listing, whenever you install uh, a package in for a project, um, you know, it automatically does two things. It's, it updates your dependencies file, um, which is this packages.json file, as well as it updates the, the lock file, which is very much akin, at least to my understanding, akin to the, the RM uh, lock file. Yeah. And again, I thought this was kind of an interesting default position, uh, which I guess makes sense in, insofar as like NPM is, 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 is very much project oriented. And so it gives you all of the defaults that you would hope for a project whereas, you know, R is, is, is very general purpose. I mean, R offers you some of these same mechanisms if you create a project, you know, if you pass through, like, you know, use this, for example, you, it offers you some of these by, by, by default, um, or at least suggests these, these helpful defaults. But I thought it was nice that NPM offers these, these guardrails that, or I shouldn't say guardrails, but maybe it is guardrails. It, so some helpful defaults that might prevent problems for you as a developer in future, right? Mm -hmm. Of keeping track of which version you're, you're, you're taking of which dependencies. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I feel like I'm spending too much time on this in just initial NPM stuff. I was just kind of interested by how, you know, it takes a s similar but interestingly different approach to, 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 to things than, than, than the R. Um, um, the kind of next thing that, that NPM, uh, this is NPM or, or, or a Webpack does is you, you have to, um, you, what you want to do, because remember here, we're, we're going to be bundle, we're going to be transpiling potentially, but definitely bundling um, multiple files into a single file. And so, what you'll want to do with um, with with npm is you'll want to uh, define what's called an entry point um, into your project, and it's sort of like a, um, uh, kind of like a master a master file that um, may import module you know uh, elements of other scripts that you have that, that constitute this project so it could be uh, import let's say particular functions from packages that you've downloaded from npm the repository um, or alternatively could kind of import functions that you've written for convenience or other reasons in other javascript files so uh, basically you have to define like where which which of these files is the file that ties it all together if you will uh, and then also um, uh, you can um, uh, you you can specify an output file that should be basically the bundle there there's a default here but you can also specify the location and name of the, the output file um, this is what the bundler is going to use um, and it's kind of just a little quick check-in on on kind of um, I've done a lot of hand waving to this point. I just wanted to show a little bit of how this how this you know file architecture might look and give a little bit of uh, you know um, in passing describe some of the contents of what we've been discussing so far. In in the book, they they start from a very simplistic stance of saying, let's imagine you have some folder that's going to contain your shiny app as well as your npm project. The two will kind of coexist. So at the root, you're going to have this app.r file that contains your shiny file, and you're going to have a few other things which are npm specific. Um, so starting, I guess, kind of from bottom and working our way to the top for the, the JS bits. Um, so you have this packages JS, which to my understanding is, is essentially just kind of like the description file in our package, list, yeah. list your dependencies. Um, this additional piece, package lock.json uh, is, is akin to, you know, the lock file in R. RN, um, so it dictates the versions that uh, of those dependencies that you want. Uh, and then lastly, um, you have 
this node modules, uh, which again, to my understanding, is kind of akin to the, the RM folder you'll find with a project that uses RM. So it's going to contain like a local, I guess an R speaking, a local library um, containing all of the, you know, all of the imported, or rather, I guess, installed um, uh, NPM pack, uh, packages. So that is packages yeah. from the NPM repository. Uh, so this is a little bit what your your file system is going to look like at at, at kind of uh, initialization, or at least it, you know if we kind of stopped yeah. in our explanation to this point, assuming that there's a, a, a corresponding workflow of you know initialize the package, do a few things. This is what your file system would look like. Up. Yeah, but with, but with that though, um, because you have a, a separate installate a, a separate set of dependencies in you know installed in a project specific position how do you ensure that you're not install you know if you've got project a and project b yep. how do you ensure that you're not installing <laughs> the same package multiple times in your computer and taking up loads of memory because i've certainly done that with things like conda environments and stuff where they're mm. installing in independent places but they're installing basically like the same packages yeah. multiple times and like trimming away the things that you install maybe that's not actually what happens maybe the maybe the issue is when you've like you've installed because uh, with rm for example it installs the dependencies in a kind of distant um library and you make a link from the rm folder of a of, of a project that you're working on to the 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 precise version that you want to install and i i often wonder that like maybe you you know you, you might end up with lots of old versions <laughs> of packages installed in that folder that you're not actually currently using in any of your projects because each of your projects has been updated, but you know you don't know how to trim away those packages that are no longer being used. Um, anyway, I don't. Hard drives are big enough. I don't think it's a huge. Problem. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean that that that's an interesting point because at least in the book it didn't discuss any behavior similar to that of RMs, where you know RM kind of looks first to your 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 library, your local local, sorry, your system library to see if those packages exist, you know, your kind of shopping list of packages that you in your lock file, those exist in the desired versions already on your machine where there's this like symbolic link. Um, so that that it didn't discuss that. And so I wonder mm -hmm. if there's any attempt here or 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 if or if the world is as kind of you describe Russ, where basically for every given project that you're doing with NPM, so every NPM project that you have, you're just downloading what you need, and what you need may well be what you also have in with some other project uh, elsewhere on your computer, right? Um, so there's some some duplication of, of file storage. Yeah, don't know, don't know. That's an interesting question though. Um, uh, to take a peek, I guess. Um, so this to kind of go quickly to the the web web. Pack. I believe this is the Webpack component. Um, no, wait. Maybe this is npm. So, so you can have a, a configuration file. No, wait. This is I think Webpack. Yeah, that looks like a package. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so here there are a few different things that are contained in in inside of your configuration file. I think this is something from Webpack. I believe went through this chapter kind of quickly. Sorry about that. Um, so. Uh, in a sense, like if you look at this file rather quickly, you can see that it contains a lot of the things one might expect as an R user from a description file, right? Um, the name of the package, the version, the, some longer description uh, of, of the of the package, um, but it also contains some some interesting parts. Some of them we'll come back to later. Um, you know, one interesting part which you've already touched on is you have this dev dependencies uh, bit where you can specify the things that other kind of well, let's say co-authors. Uh, or, or people or, or would be contributors uh, would need in order to build the package, but that aren't, you know, pack, uh, but these packages aren't required for um, the, you know, your project to do its, perform its business logic, right? Um, 
So that's something we don't find in, in R. Um, also, we'll, we'll come to these in short order. There, there are a few other things. We find this main, um, um, and we find this uh, this scripts bit. We'll come back we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, actually, it turns out we'll come immediately to the scripts bit. <laughs> I've forgotten about this. Um, so with with the scripts the scripts bit, um, what what's kind of interesting is that um, so coming back to what you're saying, Russ. Uh, you know how a lot of the package, like building a package, part of package development, is sort of abstracted away from us for for our users. We don't have to worry about it. Um, I guess the kind of the adjunct of that is, like, perhaps I'm wrong on this, is nor can we do too much about it. If there's like a standard yeah. way of like building building the package, whereas with npm, um, you know, you, you have these sort of um, in the scripts part of the configuration file with Webpack, um, you you basically have um, you can have like scripted routines, um, you know, like terminal commands basically um, that you can you can name and execute, um, and those things would correspond perhaps to build steps uh, in the process. So if we wanted to execute a test, for example, you know, I have this this the script named test that has some content. It's just you know just printing to the console. We have no tests, um, but if we wanted to run that, you know, we just run npm run test. Test being, you know, uh, the name here. Yeah. Likewise, we could build this uh, build this package by saying, you know, um, npm run build. And so this is this is the kind of the it's an aliased command right here. Um, I thought those kind of inter interesting. Um, remains to be seen, I guess, whether you know there's real value in this approach or whether this is sort of something that exists with R, but that luckily our users don't have to, to worry about. I, I, I've not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I, it's, um, it, I don't know. Uh, Cause a, a lot of these things. Um, so for yeah, um, you, a lot of the, the, these kind of tooling things are, available to us inside the R console. So although like it might be easier for um to call a command line um, um script like this. Um yep. when when you're an R user and you're kind of used to being in the R console, it, it, it makes sense for those kind of tools to be available to you within the R console rather than have to call them from the command line yeah. um but yeah but yeah but you've got complete flexibility here in yes you know, yeah. so for javascript you might use jest or you might use mocha or something like that to, to run your tests and you can define that in here whereas um um in our well actually there are lots of different test frameworks but they they work the same way in our studio and you kind of you run the tests and it just finds the scripts inside your test directory and runs them yeah um, yeah right yeah cool cool and i guess kind of one this will come to i guess a little bit of a, a case for these scripts uh, to solve a particular problem um, so th this comes back to this 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 issue of this kind of uh, issue around decoupling, right? Where as developers, uh, JavaScript developers, one would be um, you know writing JavaScript in a certain environment, um, but at the end of the day, what's passed to the browser is this bundled, thing, you know, ideally like single bundled file that contains all, all of the business logic, right? One consequence of that is if you're testing in the browser and and you hit JavaScript errors, then you those are kind of the what you'll see in the console's references to kind of where the error occurs will be with respect to your bundled file, um, not not your not kind of your like the the, the developer facing set of files, right? Yeah, and to solve yeah. this problem, yeah, uh, uh, you know, with within um, uh, you can kind of uh, sort of like have different modes of, of, of deploying your, 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 your site in a certain sense. So you can, again, have like this, uh, this build prod and build dev, right? Uh, and then you can, you can run those, you can kind of build those environments uh, through the command line. So npm run build prod, which will create your bundled file that then 
gets passed to the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to, you know, you're still kind of troubleshooting, you want to, you know, use the dev mode, which which does something different. So this is kind of a use case for for these these scripts where, where they, they might might prove really useful in practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I guess now I'll kind of come to some of the bits uh, for, for, for bundling. Um, so how, how, how would you do bundling um, with NPM? So <laughs> simple answer is you run this command, um, you know, based on what we've seen so far is like, you're just, you just build the bundle, but how then would you integrate into Shiny, right? So, um, uh, and this is just a little bit of a preview. The, the only important part I think is, is, is here, just imagine you have some Shiny app. Um, you're gonna create this, this HTML dependency object that's going to point to your bundle file, right? Attribute, you give it some name and some version, and then point to a particular place which will it'll exist in your kind of production uh, kind of environment here. By convention, um, you know JavaScript is looking for this. The you'll find it in this dist folder, which I guess is kind of like distributed code, um, uh, and then um, some file. Uh, I think the default is main.js, although I think it could be whatever name you want to give it. Uh, maybe bundle.js. Um, so this is kind of how you would bring it into, in, into Shiny in shorts. Like once you've created it from NPM, then you'd want to reference it through this HTML dependency uh, uh, object. Right. Um, speaking of dependencies, um, you know, we mentioned earlier that, you know, J with, with JavaScript, we kind of have, um, uh, you know, this internal dependencies and external dependencies. So internal dependencies are sort of simple. I'm just citing here the, some of the code that comes from the book itself. Um, uh, no, no, I, it's really there for flavor more than for, for anything else. Um, so external dependencies are pretty simple uh, in, in, with NPM. Uh, so, you know, it has a package manager. You just install packages as we've seen before. So NPM install in the name of the package and you can get the, you can kind of uh, acquire the package in that way from, from the repository. Um, and then how to make it available to your project, you need to, you need to go about kind of like exporting um, the, uh, the parts that, that, you, that you need uh, from, from, from that or, or importing. So if you want to export them, um, so internal dependencies, this would be more of a case where you've written some code. In, you know, it's not an NPM module, but you've written some code, you need to go about exporting it. There are a few ways in which you export it, but I think probably the best way to do it is this, that you have your, your script right here, and then you have this export prefix. So it's kind of akin to having, uh, you know, your, your Roxygen tag that, that exports yeah, yeah. this. Uh, but really it's exporting it, um, exporting it so that it can be used, you know, so it's available to bundle, right? Um, uh, the other, the other uh, side of it is you, so once you've exported it, whatever kind of the source, you then need to import it um, into your, your your entry point file. So let's imagine we're in the entry point file, what, whatever it's called, you know, uh, main.js or index.js. Um, so you would see import and then some name in the curly brackets. Uh, so here we've got this, this secret um, variable. Um, uh, and then you you designate its 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 source, right? So you're mm -hmm. saying I, I want to import this so that it, it'll be it'll be bundled. Um, the other case which, which is quite interesting too, is, well, so here, so far we talked about <clears throat> dependencies that could come from NPM or from code that you write. There's, there's actually, in our case, a very important third source, and that's from Shiny itself. Shiny itself has, you know, these JavaScript uh, components that can't be gotten from NPM, um, and, but yet they're kind of, in a way, an external dependency, and so we need to link them into our projects some, somehow. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, particularly if we're using Shiny to kind of like set an input value, you know, like linking JavaScript to Shiny. Um, so the way in which you do this, um, and this would occur within the, I believe, within the Webpack config file. This is just a little uh, 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 separate thing. Is you have module.exports, and then you you list, um, you know, your entry point file, um, and then the a list of external files. So just you, you'd ha here have 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 Shiny. Um, um, of, I don't know, I kind of wanted a little bit more from the book on, on this point. Maybe it's as simple as this. It just seems, I don't know, maybe, maybe it works. Um, and then kind of the last little bit to kind of bring so it all it, together. So, huh? yeah. shiny, shiny isn't on NPM. Is that, is that right? That's, it, that's right, it, yeah. Is, is it simply that they're already 
Was it simply that there were already was a project by that name on the billions <laughs> of different projects that are on MPM? And, that's that's uh, a good question. So the so the code for Shiny, the the, the JavaScript deliverable or whatever you'd call it, is encased in the Shiny R package rather than kind of linked at runtime or, or anything. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess a little bit to kind of link it all together. Um, this this is kind of the the working uh, this worked kind of pseudo work to I shouldn't say pseudo work this worked example that appears at the end of the chapter that, that that's that's kind of interesting. Um, first, you know, I guess I'll I'll talk really quickly through what this this diagram shows, and then I'll show the kind of corresponding code more than anything just to give a flavor about how how this works. Um, or anything more than a flavor, I think one would really have to work through. A comparable example oneself. Um, so uh, th this example, basically, what it attempts to do is it has this this package. Um, um, this package called Mouse Mouse Trap, um, which kind of captures um, keystrokes uh, from uh, from yeah keystrokes. Um, and and then what we have is we'll have some additional module here called so there are kind of a few few kind of imports if you will so this uh, this um, uh, mousetrap um, mousetrap package from npm which captures keystrokes this uh, secrets.js file which contains simply um, well, sorry, for the worked example, the idea is you use this mousetrap command that you're going to, you know, when the, the, the user hits your Shiny app, the UI will not appear. It'll be obf obfuscated so that you can't see anything. And then the user is meant to type the secret password, uh, at which point the UI will, will then be revealed. Um, so in order to accomplish that, you need the mousetrap, um, uh, the mousetrap uh, module. Uh, from npm or uh, sorry package from npm we're defining some secret in our javascript uh, file um, this is, uh, and then lastly we've got um, you know shiny itself as this javascript dependency so we need to kind of link all these together and then bundle them up so mm -hmm. how would how would that work so we need to kind of import this variable which was our secret you need to import shiny um, uh, tie everything together in this input js and then import it um, so first, uh, you want to import um, all the component, or so you want to import all of your components into index.js. This is the thing that's going to be your entry point, entry point file. Um, so you're going to import um, the, you're going to import the whole of this this JavaScript um, um, file here, uh, input.js. Uh, you're going to input uh, shiny from shiny. Uh, you're going to import this uh, secret, uh, the variable called secret from the secret.js um, uh, file. And then you're going to import um, the mousetrap function from the mousetrap package, right? npm right. package. Right. And then in that file, write some function that, that basically links, uh, links together um, uh, this functionality and, um, or you're going to set like a shiny. Uh, you're going to link it to this 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 input value in 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 shiny. Um, and and the so this is kind of at the this is kind of composing um, index.js. I think I may have mucked this up in the uh, in the notes here. Actually, I'll have to go back and correct this no, thereafter. No, that looks right. It's, I think I think that's right. So that that's the that's the code that would go in index.js. And yeah, it, it, it is. I, I think here the, the the issue is that just kind of to have a, a, a what do you call it a um, arbitrarily complex example. I think this is, should actually be input.js instead of uh, instead of index.js because here thereafter we're kind of importing the whole of input.js here. Um, right. Yeah. So I mean the idea is sort of like you have this this file. Uh, you have the uh, shiny dependencies. These get imported into import.js. Um, you know, and we link together mousetrap and shiny, and this kind of itself is 
I guess you can say like a module, and that module is then getting imported into index.js, which is our point, our, our entry point file from uh, NPM's perspective. Um, right. Um, once you've you've created this index.js file, you'd use npm to to bundle your code and create uh, main.js, uh, and then you know we find ourselves with this this shiny code that's much like what we saw before. It's the whole of the shiny code uh, for for this particular example. But again, we have this main.js object that we're creating is a HTML dependency object that references our our bundled file. And the bundle file now contains kind of all of the components that 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 we want for it. So, uh, one function from the mousetrap uh, package, uh, as well as uh, you know Shiny itself, uh, so that we could you know have uh, JavaScript set this this uh, Shiny input, um, and uh, and then some some other code that we've written ourselves. Uh, so that's kind of like sort of the end to end type. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a example here is if if one wanted to go along this path with an arbitrarily complex uh, setup, you know, where where you have, uh, in in a certain sense, it's almost like Russian dolls of JavaScript files, yeah, you know, yeah, where yeah. You, where you have you know at the lowest it's level, you have shows, these... it shows the, 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 the externals are things that. They're like JavaScript objects that you are able to reference by any script that's running in the browser. Is that effectively, but you're, you're not actually, they're not, uh, it, you don't have to kind of, so the shiny object is available when your um, main.js is running in, in the browser, but you haven't like bundled the shiny JavaScript source code up with whatever it is you're you're building, um, uh, whereas the secret .js is something that you've kind of you've downloaded from npm and bundled it up into your package. So it's a kind of it's a dependency, but it's now an internal version. So I'm just trying to gain a bit of like an idea about what it is that differs between the externals and secret.js and in input which you've written yourself, I guess, here. So it's good because it shows the three different forms of the JavaScript code that can get bundled up into your main.js, I guess. Yep. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so that's 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 it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. It's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, so, um, yes, the the JavaScript world, um, like even for npm, there's 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 altern there's so many alternatives for everything uh, in yeah. the JavaScript world. It seems, and like we saw that there was five or six different bundlers mentioned and um uh uh probably many other kinds of like choices that you might make um so so here so you would be you would be bundling all your code into effectively into an r package but you would have a a build step that constructs your main.js from all the other files that you have within your um, all the other JavaScript files that you've either obtained from npm or written yourself within that R package, and from that collection of files, you're making a single file that your tiny app. So you know, say in our package, but I mean it's it's a shiny app project structure, isn't it? Um, your that your shiny app would be able to um, import, uh, well, you know, access from the browser, like send to the user's computer and, and run there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and and, and additionally, the, the book mentioned in passing, and I didn't have time to kind of explore but it, it seems like one could also bundle into this 
other other files, so other assets like a you know CSS style sheets, yeah. images, and um, it mentioned in passing. It seemed like that there's some way that I guess with the idea of um, minimizing what the amount of things or kind of like the total size of the thing a thing or things that sends over to the browser that some of the CSS could get kind of uh, translated into, into JavaScript. Um, ah, right, okay, yeah. I, I, I was talking about something similar with people at work uh, a couple of weeks, uh, well, last week, I think, it, on um, there are various different flavors of CSS now. So there's, um, and they're not all legal CSS as far as the browser is concerned, but they make development of CSS simpler. So there's like SAS and S CSS and stuff, yep. which you can you can write them and they're much nicer to write because you can have variables and exactly reference other files and things like that in a way that it's harder to do in CSS. Um, and your presumably your NPM build step could take the collection of CSS files and construct a CSS file from them for delivery to uh, okay. many app, I guess. Um, hmm. Cool, cool. Right, so um, next week I will be extending this to talk about um, how you use this with R. Uh, sorry about Webpack with R, and and then even more Webpack Advanced, um, <laughs> which will be the which will be the final uh, one of these um, uh, book club sessions, uh, I think. And um, yeah, um, yeah, and I'll I'll do a little summary at the end. Um, but yeah, no, that was really it was really good because. Uh, like I, you know, I didn't, I didn't see much of the the, you know, the JavaScript development world being mentioned throughout the the, the rest of the book. Really, maybe I just m missed it. But yeah, so things that I'm I'm aware of from, um, you know, just talking to people and stuff like npm and that. Um, hadn't really cropped up in the first couple of sections, which is quite nice. So it's quite nice that they've got this bit at the end to 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 tie it to modern JavaScript development as well. One thing I'd, I'd kind of like to look into, maybe between sessions, uh, Russ is, and maybe you've looked into this too. Uh, we can chat about this offline, maybe perhaps as a, um, you know, there's a new framework Rhino. Uh, so you know, like the Absalon team, I think are. They, in the main, I think they're coming much more from the web dev um, world, and so I, I'd, be, I'd be curious to see like how much they make this integration between the JavaScript development world, uh, or maybe just like the web dev world more broadly, and R. Like how much they make it tighter, or, like give easier access to kind of more modern tools, easier, yeah. and or even just in the way that the framework is set up, how, how they might simplify the the, the, the work of, of uh, Shiny developers, if, if at all. Anyway, it's just yeah, a yeah. simple point no, of interest. I, I, no, I do, I do know a little bit about it, but mostly um, from, um, it, where is it now? So a Rhino project, um, it's quite an interesting setup as far as the shiny app's concerned. Um, so it's not like you're developing a package like you would be for um, Gollum, yeah. Gollum or Leprechaun, which is a similar, a more lightweight version of the, the thing that Gollum is fast in. Um, Rhino uses a completely different way of structuring the, the, the R file. So it uses a kind of um oh i think it's box or modules or something like that that that, that was developed for for like um it import importing from specific files in your r directory rather than it, you know loading up a whole, a whole packages worth of yeah functions. that's the package i was looking for earlier box yeah yeah it, it also has um 
it, 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 like rather than a, a typical shiny project, you might use shiny test or shiny test two or something for like the front end driven testing and stuff. It, it, Rhino uses um, Cypress for that kind of stuff, which is the one of the kind of standout JavaScript front end testing libraries. Um, and it's, it, to be honest, it's a really good choice be, because the, the stuff that you can do with a package like that is far beyond what any test two would be capable of doing. But it doesn't necessarily have access to things like, you know, the values stored within the shiny inputs and outputs and stuff like that that that, that you could access from shiny test two trivially. Um, right. it, it, it is an interesting pro proposition, Rhino, but I I've, I think it, it's a little bit um I think it's a little bit complicated at the moment but i have worked with apps that are built in a similar kind of way but i think they've kind of iterated towards rhino as a um way of building shiny apps along <laughs> many many different threads um anyway yeah um cool yeah uh but we can talk about that in the slack channel if, if you you're interested in sure. talking about rhino um yeah cool cool Right. Um, cool. Well, I'll see you next week. Um, lovely to speak yep. to you again. And uh, have, a, have a nice week. All right. Likewise. Bye-bye. <laughs>